Alrighty. Ooh. <laughs> Let's see. Hi there, how's everyone? <laughs> Hi there, everyone. So I'm just gonna wait a little bit before I uh, start the official demo. Uh, Hi Julia, how are you? Jennifer, how are you again? Miss Vento, oh my god, how are you? Did you have Miss Vento? No, I didn't. In Wagner? Did you have Miss Vento? No. no? Oh my gosh, she's watching. How are you, Amy? So just very quickly, I'm gonna give a few minutes before we start uh, the actual demo so that everyone can uh, fully join uh, the demonstration. Uh, I'm also gonna quickly check that everything's working. I have my laptop here off to the side. Hmm. Yeah, I hope everyone's uh, excited. Um, I hope everyone's enjoying the um, uh, the Cake Expo. It's been definitely a gratifying experience. I'm sure you've already uh, seen quite a lot of uh, demonstrations from a lot of sugar artists, from uh, uh, cake artists. Um, and I wanna say thank you to Jennifer who's put in a lot of work uh, to make this happen. Uh, a lot of diligent work, to be quite honest. And, uh, you know, the IC's board, to be quite honest, who's put a lot of effort into uh, diverting that effort into creating an online uh, convention. Uh, it's really great. So, with that said, um, I actually wasn't planning on attending the uh, convention this year. Um, but again, hope, I'm happy that this virtual uh, convention has given the platform for a lot of us to still be a part of the community, if you will, uh, for kick artistry. So yeah. So again, hi everyone. Good evening. Uh, it is evening here in New York City. So uh, so hopefully, uh, <laughs> hopefully everyone out there around the world is either enjoying their evening, enjoying their morning, and so on and so forth. So very quickly, as a quick preface, I am here actually working in um, one of my friend's uh, kitchens. Uh, for anyone who follows me, they've seen my work. I've been posting uh, photos from uh, a photo shoot that I did in this kitchen. So that is why I'm in a very nice looking kitchen today. Yeah. So let's see, who else is joining us? Hey there, Jan, how are you? <laughs> All right, so perhaps one more minute and then I'll fully introduce myself, so yeah. So very, um, again, hopefully everyone's doing well. Uh, just a quick interlude as to like what this demo is going to be. This is a very um, overarching look on chocolate. So Jan Wolf earlier today did a mirror uh, glazed cake with a chocolate flower demo. I know down the line, Beth Meyer is gonna do a chocolate shoe demonstration. This one uh, specifically uh, as a chocolatier, as a pastry chef, I'm going to uh, speak to uh, you guys about how to properly work with chocolate as well as the um, capabilities that you guys can have or the projects that you can create when it comes to uh, chocolate. Right? So I think most of everyone has joined us. Uh, we waited a couple minutes now. So as a very quick interlude again, many people here uh, know who I am, but for those of you who may not know who I am, my name is Daniel Joseph Corpus. I'm a pastry chef, sugar artist, and chocolatier. I'm based here in New York City on Staten Island, so that is where I currently am. Um, I've been part of ICES for about five years now, and in that time, I'm happy to have achieved the ICES approved teacher accreditation, as well as the ICES uh, certified judge uh, certification, uh, as denoted by my medal over here on the left, or my left, as well as uh, this pin over here on my left collar. Uh, I've been in, in the industry for about almost a decade at this point. Uh, I'm a proud graduate of the Culinary Institute of America. I graduated with my associate's degree in baking and pastry and my bachelor's degree in food business administration. And I graduated uh, last year um, at this, um, in July, so I'm happy to have completed that. Um, my background specifically for the longest time was wedding cake design specializing in sugar flowers. Uh, where I've competed at cake shows like the National Capital Area Cake Show, the Great American Cake Show when it was still up and running, the New York Cake Show, as well as most recently the uh, Austin uh, That Takes the Cake Cake Show in Austin, Texas. Uh, and again, many of those who know who I am, my style specifically are wedding cakes with a lot of sugar flowers. Um, so yeah, but on a more professional level, um, with you know going to culinary school, my background has shifted from wedding cake design and primarily into restaurant or fine dining. Uh, so over my time, I've been able to work at the Modern at MoMA in New York City, which is a two Michelin star restaurant uh, owned by Danny Meyer, which is part of the Union Square Hospitality Group. Uh, I also did a small or short time at the Clock Tower, which was a one Michelin star restaurant at the Edition Hotel um, around um, Madison Square Park. 
And uh, most recently, I was currently working at Manhatta, which is one of Danny Meyer's newest restaurants as part of the Union Square uh, Hospitality Group, which was uh, honestly a super pretty restaurant. And uh, uh, because of COVID, definitely, um, I'm not working there at the moment, but I look forward to uh, going back and working with my coworkers. But with that said, a lot of what I do, uh, or my love definitely, or a medium that I'm very um, heavy handed on is chocolate. Uh, and by the way, I'm a New Yorker, so you will definitely hear me say chocolate with that uh, accent, so don't mind me. Uh, but with that said, chocolate is definitely something that I love and have worked with for the past uh, few years now. And uh, a lot of people know that I do a lot of chocolate show pieces uh, and definitely confectionery arts and um, chocolate bonbons. So that is the crux of what this demonstration is going to be, is talking about chocolate, how to use it, as well as, um, you know, different styles, if you will, or different techniques to creating chocolate show pieces, chocolate bonbons, and so on and so forth. Um, so with that said, first things first is let's talk about what chocolate is. So chocolate is essentially a fruit uh, that is grown in uh, tropical regions, about 20 degrees north and south of the equator, uh, primarily again in tropical regions. So a lot of areas that are well known for chocolate uh, production include Western Africa, so that's Madagascar, Sierra Leone, uh, Ghana, uh, as well as, let's say, Central and South America, so that includes Ecuador, uh, the Caribbean, as well as Peru. Uh, and then also in South and Southeast Asia, where you have countries like Vietnam, Malaysia, uh, and the Philippines, who are also creating uh, chocolate. So, very quickly, I'm sure we all know what chocolate looks like when uh, we buy it from the store, but before we even buy it from the store, what chocolate looks like are these pods. So, these are actually dried cacao pods, um, uh, that are again dried. So first of all, they are natural maracas. So the seeds or pods or yeah, seeds inside actually dry up so you can hear it, which is fun. But I use them primarily for decoration, photo shoots, as well as uh, talking about them. Uh, because again, as a fruit, they will die over time. So these guys are just, you know, dried out. So it allows me to uh, house them or keep them, if you will. So again, this is a cacao pod. And first of all, there is a difference between cacao versus cocoa. Cacao is the actual fruit or the full name of the actual fruit before it's been processed. After it being processed, it then becomes cocoa. So we are familiar with cocoa butter, cocoa powder, uh, but this in itself is cacao. Uh, as you can see, it is first of all dried, but when it's grown, it's actually quite uh, vibrant in color, vibrant in the sense of greens, yellows, oranges, and reds, and is this oblong shape. And as you can see, it, it, it actually is not as um, consistent as you would think. Chocolate for the most part, or cacao, is harvested about twice a year, uh, depending on uh, regional uh, environmental concerns and uh, uh, labor uh, you know, concerns as well. But in essence, it is twice a year. And um, essentially the way chocolate is made is we take this cacao pod, we open it up, and when you open it up, when it's fresh, it actually has pulp inside, which is white, as well as the cacao seeds inside. So the seeds is actually what creates uh, chocolate. So the way chocolate is made, once it is harvested, those seeds are then actually uh, dried out and fermented over a, a period of weeks, if you will. And that fermentation process is quite important to get the uh, distinct flavor of chocolate. Um, the acidity that we get when it comes to chocolate is, um, you know, comes from that drying and fermentation period uh, that uh, chocolate or cacao goes through. And again, each farm, each regionality, each region will have its own specifics as to how to create chocolate. Uh, but afterwards, after it's been uh, dried out and fermented, those cacao seeds are then processed to make chocolate. So the processes to create chocolate is, first of all, a, uh, one, of, or one of them, or the first step is to roast uh, these cacao uh, beans. Uh, by roasting, you get that almost like warm flavor, if you will. Uh, when it comes to uh, chocolate. Afterwards, it is cracked, shelled, and winnowed. So cracking, get that shell out, so you get the pulp, in, or rather the innards of the actual uh, seed. Um, winnowing is a process where there's a fan that sucks up a skin that forms around uh, the seed itself. And then now you're left with actual um, cocoa nibs. So if you will, let's see, where did I put it? It's near me somewhere. It's always the case. Over here. I have a small container of actual cocoa nibs. So after it has been cracked and winnowed, essentially this over here are 
um, cocoa nibs. So again, it's processed, so that's why we're calling it cocoa. And this is the crux or the main ingredient when it comes to truffle. This is the cocoa solids that we find when it comes to chocolate. Um, so that's that. And then again, other ingredients, which we'll talk about in a sec, are then added into the chocolate to create the distinct chocolates that we know and work with and love to eat as well. All right, so with that said, again, cacao pods grown in tropical regions. Um, how it's made, again, cracked, winnowed, roasted, fermented, and then again, that, um, at the end of the day, is made into actual chocolate, All right? So I'll put that on the side. So what comprises chocolate? There are four main ingredients in chocolate, of which I have in front of me right here. Uh, right over here we have is, again, those cocoa nibs, the cocoa solids that uh, make up the primary bulk of chocolate. Over here is cocoa butter, which is the fat in chocolate, which, we'll, again, we'll talk about later on, sugar, and milk powder. Depending on the chocolate that we use, eat, or love, uh, there's a difference between the composition of each of that chocolate. So when it comes to chocolate, there are three uh, main types of chocolate that we work with and know. That is dark chocolate, milk chocolate, and white chocolate. Each again has a different percentage and a different makeup to it. Let's start off with dark chocolate, which first of all is this one. Dark chocolate. Dark chocolate, for those of you who love chocolate, uh, is primarily made up of three ingredients, which is cocoa nibs, cocoa butter, and sugar. Again, different variations, different um, percentage levels, but that is the three main flavors of chocolate. Dark chocolate is uh, classified as dark because it, has, because it has a high percentage of the cocoa uh, product, making it that dark, if you will, intense chocolate flavor. So this is actually one of a, uh, this is one of the dark chocolates that I personally use uh, from Valrona, and we'll talk about um, branding, or rather brands of chocolate in a little bit. The second uh, chocolate that I have behind me is Jabara, which is a milk chocolate. So milk chocolate, again, is a happy medium between dark and white. Uh, when it comes to ingredients that it has, it is primarily all four of the ingredients. So it is cocoa nibs, cocoa butter, sugar, and milk powder. So there's a higher percentage of sugar, which is why it's slightly sweeter. And the reason why uh, milk chocolate is uh, creamier is because of the milk powder that is added to it. So that's that. And again, the last type of chocolate that we have is white chocolate. So white chocolate is the most intense when it comes to creaminess, uh, sweetness as well. And the primary reason is because it is made up of uh, milk powder, sugar, and cocoa butter. So again, it doesn't have any of the cocoa solids or cocoa nibs, which is why it is white. But because it has the cocoa butter, it is still classified as chocolate. Um, just as an aside, uh, there is technically a fourth type of chocolate called ruby chocolate, which is a naturally red or naturally pink colored chocolate, uh, primarily found in Southeast South Asia. Um, and um, right now, currently, there is one company that sells it uh, and produces it, which is Coco Berry uh, or Calibo. Um, and yeah, it is a very, it's super cool. If, you've ha if you haven't tasted it before, it's a very intense acidic chocolate. So if that is definitely um, your palate or that is what you prefer, that is a chocolate that I would recommend trying to seek out uh, to try. So that's that. Okay. So with that said, all three of these chocolates are different, again, in the sense of composition um, of them. Dark chocolate, again, has that very intense uh, chocolatey flavor that, again, many people like or do not like. Uh, milk chocolate has that, uh, again, happy medium, has that creaminess, that sweetness, whereas sometimes uh, uh, white chocolate has a, a super sweet, super intense uh, milky creaminess uh, to the flavors of that. So with that said, since we're talking about flavors uh, when it comes to chocolate, note that every chocolate, or actually, time out, first things first, let's talk about the difference between Couverture chocolate and compound chocolate, or in essence, what chocolate versus candy melts are. And that I think is a very important distinction when it comes to chocolatier, as a chocolatier, as a pastry chef, as a sugar artist, or even a cake artist. Um, definitely when it comes to our industry as cake artists, there is a big uh, usage of candy melts. But please know that candy melts are not chocolate. The reason, be because, the reason why is because uh, candy melts are essentially chocolate flavored uh, candies and that is why they're called candy melts and they're not called chocolate. Um, the reason is because again we discussed the composition of chocolate which again are these four main ingredients. The problematic or the problematic ingredient here is the cocoa butter. Cocoa butter which we'll assess later on is both the 
uh, best thing or the best part in chocolate, but also the worst part in chocolate. And by that, I mean the reason why chocolate is so smooth, so creamy, so shiny is because of cocoa butter. But the reason why chocolate is so difficult to work with is also because of this cocoa butter. Um, when it comes to candy melts or wafers or compound chocolate, the difference there is, is that these chocolates have extracted the cocoa butter uh, in it and has been replaced with a more stable um, fat, if you will, uh, some of which include, um, uh, if you will, coconut oil, palm oil, and so on and so forth, which are, again, easier to work with. So that, first of all, is a big clarification that we need to talk about. When it comes to a pastry chef, when it comes to uh, chocolatiers, what I primarily use and what we primarily use is couverture chocolate. And couverture chocolate are chocolates that primarily and only have uh, cocoa butter in it and usually have a higher percentage of cocoa butter, uh, which again is the fat in chocolate. So that is, I think, one of the first distinctions that we should uh, discuss when it comes to what chocolate is. Right. So very quickly, let's see what is going on in the chat. All right, so back to flavors. Chocolate, first of all, um, again, we have the distinction of chocolate being dark milk and white. However, on a chocolatier or a pastry chef's position, I think we should even think about where it's from. Uh, in this sense, we talk about chocolate almost similar to wine, um, where the regionality, where it's grown, how it's grown, is a big factor as to the flavor in chocolate. And Valrona, which is the brand that I primarily use, um, you know, hits that uh, you know, very, very hard, if you will, in the sense that some of their dark chocolates actually have different flavors to it based on where the chocolate is grown. So very quickly, we talked about this bag right here, which is uh, Valrona's Manjari, um, which is a 64% chocolate. It is single origin chocolate, uh, primarily from Madagascar. Um, and this chocolate specifically has a lot of red fruit, very spice notes to it. So when you eat it, you get that uh, almost like flavor profile in it. Another one of their chocolates, dark chocolates that I primarily use, I don't have a bag with me today, is Karib. And Karib is actually a 66% uh, cacao, uh, or, and um, its primary flavor profile is actually very acidic, very um, uh, aromatic, if you will, and goes very well with almonds and coffee. So um, again, based on that premise, chocolate can be seen similar to wine and a word that encapsulates this like uh, flavor based off of regionality is uh, a word uh, which is terroir. And that word specifically, again, speaks to how uh, where you grow your product ends up um, affecting the flavor profile that you have when it comes to chocolate. So again, as a pastry chef, as a um, confectioner, a big uh, part when it comes to making chocolates is the flavor profile or flavor that we wanna work with. So if I'm making, let's say a cherry, uh, cherry based dessert, I might want to actually opt for manjari, which again has those red fruit um, uh, flavors. So you're bridging those flavors together. Whereas let's say if I'm making something along the lines of coffee or again, almonds, I might want to use Karib because it has those notes in it. So again, it is very, um, you know, on a different level when it comes to working with chocolate. Okay. So again, that is essentially the uh, flavor profile when it comes to chocolate and deciding which to use. All right. Um, and again, as for, let's say, uh, other chocolates that Valrona has, um, technically this, which is Irvoir 33%, I'm sorry, I'm sorry 35%, uh, and this over here, which is Dulce 32%, are technically uh, in the family of white chocolates. Um, or a better example, rather, is actually this one over here, which is Javara 40%, and this over here, as I pull out every bag behind me, is uh, Caramelia 36%, both of which are milk chocolates. The just, <laughs> the difference is that Javara is a very standalone milk chocolate. When we think about milk chocolate, that's what I usually think about. Caramelia, the difference here is, is that when the chocolate is made, the sugar is actually caramelized. So this actually has a very caramel flavor profile to it uh, compared to the Javara. So again, these little, these little minute details are definitely something that come into play when it comes to um, uh, being a confectioner, being a chocolatier, being a pastry chef. Uh, and again, can also be translated into uh, how we work with uh, chocolate as uh, cake artists. All right. So, we set up, put the bags back behind me. So, first of all, I want to say thank you to everyone who uh, sticks with me for the whole two hours. Um, 
when I proposed this demo, um, I knew that I wanted this to be a very intensive demo uh, on the look of what chocolate is. And uh, I think the reason why is because when we think about sugar artistry or cake artistry, we have this overarching umbrella of what sugar artistry is. One of which, one of those big umbrellas is cake artistry. But sometimes we forget that another one of those umbrellas or another one of those um, factors is showpiece construction. And there are three types of showpiece constructions, um, blown sugar or isomalt, uh, passage and chocolate. Um, blown sugar and um, ice malt has definitely has definitely been on the forefront. Uh, a lot of people use it when it comes to competitions, and that's uh, primarily in part to uh, the work of Sydney Galpern uh, from Simi Cakes, who's definitely put that on the map, if you will, for ice malt uh, and blown sugar, which is uh, and her classes definitely have uh, made it easier for people to you know work with sugar, work with ice malt. Passage is essentially a uh, uh, sugar dough that dries super hard um, that isn't used as much to be quite honest. It's a very traditional um, medium uh, and chocolate to be quite honest again is a um, very traditional medium but can be very difficult to work with and is sometimes um, a um, if you will a deterrent for some people to work with it. So um, is the reason why I wanted to uh, introduce this demo. So first of all uh, also, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to uh, put it down in the comments. If I miss it uh, during the actual demo, I'll definitely go back and answer those questions at the end uh, through the comments. If I find any on the actual live stream, I'll answer them. But if I uh, miss it either, I don't. If I miss it again, I'll, I'll come back to it. Or if I see it and it is something that's uh, going to come up later on, I actually will uh, bypass that to talk about it. Right? So with that said, we've talked about chocolate. Uh, let's talk about chocolate brands, if you will. So behind me, you can see there's quite a lot of uh, Valrona behind me, based on the bags uh, that you see behind me, as well as the bars. Uh, and that is the chocolate that I primarily use. When it comes to Couverture chocolate, I primarily use three main brands. Uh, the first one is uh, Valrona. Uh, second is Coco Berry, Calibo, um, or like the same their family, if you will, uh, companies. And the last one is Guitard. And those are the three main companies when it comes to the chocolates that I personally use. But again, primarily I use Valrona, which is why I have it flanking me on both my left and my right. Uh, don't get me wrong, there are other brands out there. Um, Fleshland is another one. Susan Nodder is a very big uh, proponent of uh, Fleshland, uh, and she uses that um, quite often. Uh, but again, Valrona is just the chocolate that I primarily use. Um, Note that, again, you can also make your own chocolate. Uh, I just uh, recently bought a uh, melanger, or melange, uh, which is actually a chocolate refiner. So I can actually take these cocoa nibs uh, and actually grind it in that, um, in that uh, machine and make my own chocolate as well. So I'm excited to do so. I just ordered some uh, cocoa nibs from the Philippines. So I'm excited to actually make some Filipino chocolate uh, at home um, with a Filipino background, uh, my family is also my family and friends are quite excited for me to uh, make some Filipino chocolate uh, that I've made myself. Right. So, with that said, ooh, before I continue, last thing, Valrona actually has created a line of chocolate called Inspirations, which are specifically flavored chocolates, um, and I have four of their five uh, chocolates currently, um, and. What they are essentially are flavored, again, flavored cocoa butter chocolates. So it is chocolate with the flavor of the uh, inspiration itself. So they have five currently on the line. They have almond, which is this one. They have strawberry, which is this one. Raspberry, which was just finally introduced uh, into the US uh, this past February. And this one is passion fruit. The other one I don't have is yuzu, uh, which is a, uh, an Asian citrus, to be quite honest. And these have definitely changed the game for a lot of us as chocolatiers, as pastry chefs, as we are now able to impart those flavors into our uh, confections, into our desserts on a uh, chocolate level, if you will. So that's that. Um, but yeah. Oh, and lastly, note that when it comes to buying chocolate, I understand that for some people, uh, or rather in general, chocolate is quite expensive to work with. Uh, the reason why I brought up those different brands is just note that this bag, if you will, of chocolate, which is three kilograms, can run you about a hundred plus dollars retail. Um, Coco Berry uh, or Calibo is a slight uh, decrease when it comes to that uh, price point. But uh, Guitard, I know that on ChefRubber.com, which is where I buy my cocoa butter colors, they actually sell Guitard chocolate and they can act they sell, I believe, 12 kilos so you can buy four bags of three kilos each if i'm not mistaken don't quote me but that price point is about 120 to 150 dollars 
So for you guys as uh, uh, prospective chocolatiers, as chocolatiers, uh, price point is definitely a big, um, you know, portion of that uh, decision or factor when it comes to working with chocolate. So if you want to go for a bag, of, uh, one bag of Valrona for 120 bucks, again, that is uh, how I uh, personally, you know, that's the chocolate I personally use. But let's say if you're going for more of a cost effectiveness, you can potentially go to chefrubber.com and buy about 12 kilos of chocolate for, uh, again, that same price point of one bag of Valrona. So again, it is what it is, depending, right? So. With that said, let's actually start working with chocolate, right? That's always a, a fun thing. Uh, I'll move uh, a couple things around and we'll actually temper chocolate, which is the primary uh, step when it comes to chocolate, all right? So I'm gonna quickly move some of these ingredients back over here. All righty. And let's see, where am I going? All right, so with that said, we're gonna move over and we're gonna start making some, uh, or tempering some chocolate. So I'm gonna grab the melted chocolate. So I do have friends with me today, which is why if you hear snickering, if you hear um, uh, my friend's dog barking, that is the reason why. New York City is also always loud, so I'm sure you've already heard the motorcycles, trucks, or whatever going on outside. Um, but with that said, uh, it is still fun, and I cannot imagine myself not being here. All right, so let's talk about tempering. Tempering specifically is a process where we raise and lower the, temp uh, lower the temperature of chocolate to get the nice qualities of it. When we think about chocolate, the nice qualities in it are a nice snap when we break it apart, a melted enough feeling as well as a shiny finish to it. And again, like I said, cocoa butter is the reason why uh, chocolate is that. However, is also the reason why it is difficult to work with. The reason why is because uh, cocoa butter is a polymorphic fat. What that means is that it can actually take upon or take on the shape of si uh, here, rephrase. Uh, what that means essentially is, is that uh, cocoa butter can take on six different uh, shapes or forms depending on how it is cooled. Uh, the problem is, is that forms uh, four, uh, five and six are the only ones that are stable, meaning that it is properly tempered. Forms one, two, three, and four are unstable, which will produce bloom when it comes to chocolate uh, uh, settling or cooling down. So a big part of what we do as chocolatiers is we actually temper chocolate. What we're doing when we're tempering chocolate is that we are essentially forcing the chocolate in, uh, to become form five crystals uh, so that when we fully set the rest of the chocolate, um, it actually has those nice qualities. So as another look at it, I'm sure back in science, we uh, talk about crystalline structure and essentially what fats, uh, what cocoa butter has or what fats have are crystals in it. So when we buy chocolate, it essentially has a, uh, chain like this where it is super strong the bond is strong so when we break it up again that nice snap um but when we melt chocolate fully those um crystals actually deform and are free form in the chocolate as a liquid if we just set chocolate without tempering it those crystals will come back together but again randomly so it can come back like this and come back like this and so on and so forth but the problem as you can see like if it forms like this it is not as strong as it was when it was tempering. So by pre-crystallizing or by tempering our chocolate, we are realigning those crystals so that when it properly sets, it comes back together as we found it, as we melted it, so that our chocolate is again strong, if you will. So again, stronger than if it were just random. Uh, and when chocolate blooms, uh, it presents itself as either white streaks, dots, and again, very un- on uh, unflattering characteristics. So if you've ever bought, let's say, a, a chocolate bar, uh, left it on the sun, left it in the car, and you got home and it's melted. You put it in the freezer just so that you can still eat it without it, like, you know, without like eating melted chocolate. Uh, but when you open up that package after, after it being in the freezer, you might see those white streaks. And that essentially is what bloom is. Your chocolate has recrystallized or set in a random way, which is why it is no longer as, um, again, uh, ideal when we think about chocolate. So when it comes to pre-crystallization, oh, excuse me, pre-crystallization, or when it comes to tempering, uh, there are two types or two ways of uh, tempering. So first of all, over here, I, I have invested in a chocolate melter. Uh, I buy my chocolate melters, which is Molde Art, that is the brand, but I buy from Technobake, which is a company in St. Louis. Um, and it is a dry heat melter. So you can melt your chocolate in different ways. 
uh, you can put it in the microwave, again, microwave 30 seconds, and then you slowly, um, if you will, stir it each time. But the problem is, is that like, you know, chocolate's so expensive, chocolate's so like, such a nice ingredient, that to nuke the chocolate is, uh, you know, I find it, you know, I find it off-putting, to be quite honest. Um, you can put it over a bain-marie or a water bath, so you have um, chocolate uh, in a bowl, uh, and you put it over a pot of boiling water, and you melt it. The problem there is, is that the one enemy of chocolate, or the primary enemy of chocolate, is water. As soon as water is introduced into your main chocolate, which is, again, a fat, it will seize or it will take your chocolate out of uh, what it should be. So when you boil water, that water vapor escaping from the actual pot will then muck. There's a risk that it comes into contact with your chocolate, again, re, um, ruining your chocolate. So by taking this melter, it is a dry heat melter. Um, you know, so it actually melts my chocolate without any uh, fear of any water, but it also uh, brings it to a temperature about 60 degrees Celsius, uh, which is the highest temp that I can take. Uh, but again, if you use the microwave, if you use a bain-marie water bath, whatever it is, just make sure that you're, uh, you know, careful when it comes to working with chocolate. As we discussed, uh, a bag of Valrhona is about 120 bucks, and it would suck if you uh, introduced water unwittingly and you ruined the bag of your chocolate that you just melted. Right. So, two ways of tempering, seeding or tabling. Seeding, essentially, you take a bowl of chocolate, which I have just put here, you saw me put it in the bowl. You're taking, essentially, uh, already tempered chocolate, which is this um, pint container. Uh, again, of these seed. And essentially you're putting about 20, 20 to 25% of the chocolate's weight in tempered chocolate into this and you're stirring it together to, uh, again, create those crystals. The fact that this is chocolate, or rather that this is tempered chocolate, will promote the crystallization process in the melted chocolate, which is again, all free form at the moment. The second way of tempering is tabling. Tabling, essentially you're taking your bowl of chocolate, you're pouring about two thirds to three quarters of your chocolate onto a marble countertop. So again, I have a, I'm working on a uh, marble island right now, but I have this uh, marble slab that I personally work with at home just because I don't have a marble countertop. Um, and the reason why we use marble, granite, um, or stone is because some of these stones, what they do is they inherently suck in heat. So if you've ever touched marble, if you've ever touched granite, uh, you can actually feel a slight cooling to it. And the reason is because it is sucking in that heat. Um, but yeah, so with that said, you can also table temper on glass. I've done that before. Uh, at my house, uh, where I actually live, in my, in my family's apartment, we have a glass, if you will, uh, sheet on top of our wooden table. And uh, to table temper on that, I have to actually turn on the AC. The fact that the AC is on will actually cool the environment, cooling the chocolate air, or rather, I'm sorry, cooling the surface on which the chocolate goes on, uh, simulating the, almost the marble or granite, granite effect. I've also seen people table temper on stainless steel, but note that stainless steel um, can sometimes, uh, if you will, degrade. So some of those bits of stainless steel go into chocolate, which is not necessarily ideal, right? So with that said, first of all, I work with chocolate in Celsius. If there are uh, temperatures that I know uh, that I can quickly bring into uh, Fahrenheit, I'll bring that up, but I primarily work in Celsius. So right now, I have two thermometers, to be quite honest. I have one that's a probe. Uh, this is a laser thermometer, as you can see. I don't know if you can see it. the, okay. Laser thermometer, it gives me the surface temperature of the actual chocolate, whereas this is a probe thermometer where I can actually get the temperature of the inside of the chocolate, so it gives me a better gauge of what the chocolate is. So that is why I work with both. Um, so right now my chocolate is currently melted at 46 degrees Celsius. And again, that is the surface temperature. To quickly check the, um, temperature within the chocolate, it is 40, oh, 48 degrees. So that is the um, underlying fact, oh, it's actually 49. The underlying fact with the surface and the internal temperature. The difference between the temperature can be as drastic as five degrees Celsius as a margin of error, which again can throw your chocolate off. And the reason why I say that is because when it comes to chocolate, it is very precise when it comes to temperatures and how much we're working, with, uh, working on it. So it is, very important to check the both the surface and the internal temperature of your actual chocolate. So, again, like I said, table tempering, we're gonna pour out a good two thirds to three quarters of our chocolate out onto the marble countertop. And what we're doing is we're essentially agitating our chocolate. Agitating, essentially forcing that chocolate to come together or to form those form five crystals that we spoke about uh, already. 
Um, and by agitating, I just mean spreading, essentially. When it comes to tabling, you are spreading your chocolate, agitating it, and cooling it down. When it comes to seeding, the agitation or the form of agitation that we talk about is the stirring effect that we have when we're stirring the seeded uh, chocolate into our melted chocolate. And what we're trying to get to from 45 degrees Celsius, we are going to bring this mass on the marble down to about 27 degrees Celsius. At 27 degrees Celsius, we already have those uh, form five crystals formed. And then we are going to bring it back into the bowl that we uh, originated from. And by putting it back into the bowl, we're gonna reheat that chocolate back up to 32 degrees Celsius. Chocolate has a very specific uh, working range, if you will, and each different chocolate, dark, milk, and white, has a different range. Uh, when it comes to dark chocolate, that working range is about 31 to 32 degrees Celsius. For um, milk and white chocolate, it's about uh, 28, 29 degrees Celsius. So uh, margin of error, and again, uh, those are rough estimates or precise estimates, rather, of the working temperature of a chocolate. So as you see, I'm literally just scraping it, pushing it, and just essentially shearing the chocolate onto the marble, cooling it down, getting those nice qualities in it. So right now it is at 30 degrees Celsius. We're gonna bring it down again uh, about two more degrees, or rather uh, three more degrees, to get the nice qualities in chocolate. So. So, Christina, I don't know, are there any questions in the chat currently? There was one question, oh, but exciting. it was answered, I think. Um, Carrie asked, where do you get the information on the different flavors of chocolate, meaning which is better to use with which flavor? All right, so Carrie, uh, which was the question about uh, where you get information for flavors of chocolate, the manufacturer or brand that you use primarily has those uh, flavor profiles or a flavor breakdown. So Valrona specifically, since again, I use them, on their website, it actually lists out um, what flavor profile each chocolate has. So Manjari, Karib, Arguani, um, uh, Guanaja, which again are four dark chocolates, all have different flavor profiles. So they list out um, you know, which flavors uh, it has and which flavors it goes well with. But with that said, as a general overlook, note that um, when it comes to uh, Western African or African chocolate, there's a very boldness to it, very richness to it, uh, red fruit flavor. When it comes to uh, Caribbean or South, uh, you know, Central America, you get a very you know subtle uh, acidic uh, note, uh, almost citrusy, if you will. And uh, for South and Southeast Asian chocolates, there's a general, if you will, acidic flavor. Uh, but also a subtle bitterness to it. So that's, that is an overarching uh, look when it comes to the flavor profile of chocolates from different regionalities. Mm -hmm. So, great question. So, first of all, let's check the temp. So we are at 26 degrees, so that's actually perfect that we've gone a little bit low, lower rather than 27. So that again is the surface temperature. I'm going to quickly check the internal temperature, just again, check which is at 27. So again, the difference there is quite, again, minute, but can make the biggest difference. When it comes to chocolate, every single step that you uh, make or do, every process that you uh, perform is very, very important. And there is no real, you know, cutting corners of you when it comes to chocolate. Um, because let's say I improperly temper my chocolate. I have already uh, airbrushed my mold, I've already made my filling, so on and so forth. I pour this chocolate into my mold, I fill it, everything else that I do, and then when I try to pop my chocolates or bonbons out of my mold, it doesn't because it was uh, improperly tempered from the start. So it would suck, and it had, you know, I, coming from personal experience, it absolutely sucks putting hours of work in, just knowing that you, you know, the reason why it didn't come out is because you didn't check the temperature of the chocolate. Double check, triple check, quadruple check the temperature of chocolate. Um, so those little things definitely make a difference. All right, so that said, again, we're at 26. Uh, margin error, let's split it down, 26 and a half degrees Celsius. So we're going to put back, and first of all, you can actually see the chocolate is actually thicker than what it was originally, which is, again, super fluid. So we're gonna pour back, um, or scrape back some of this chocolate into our bowl, as cleanly as I can. I'm actually doing small bursts of the chocolate. Alright. 
thing with chocolate is that if you don't clean as you go, it will spiral into an absolute tornado that can be absolutely chaotic. So I will say, I'm gonna quickly clean the model. I have these towels that are uh, permanently stained in chocolate, so they are a chocolate colored towel. Um, but to be quite honest, uh, like I said, chocolate can get very, very chaotic quickly. So I'm going to quickly clean up my area. All right. There we go. All right. So we add, again, three quarters to three, um, three quarters to two thirds of the chocolate into our marble. So we are left off with about a quarter to a third of our chocolate. So we're going to reincorporate that chocolate, mix it together so that we are bringing it back to the temperature that we need to use it for. And right now, after mixing it just a little bit, we are currently at 30 degrees Celsius. So what we can do, we have a few options here as to reheating our chocolate. One is we can use a heat gun or a hair dryer that blows warm, dry air, which is what I normally do, uh, to get it back to 32 degrees. The important thing is, is that when you're heating up your chocolate from this state, you should not go over 32, uh, 32 degrees. If you go over 32 degrees Celsius, you have now taken this entire bowl out of temper, meaning that you're going to have to do the process all over again, which again, sucks. Um, so with that said, uh, be mindful as to how you're heating up your chocolate and how much. Uh, you can actually put it on a stove top burner, actually like, you know, you know, with a flame on, quick two seconds, take it off, mix it to see if it heated up. Uh, you can even take an immersion blender uh, blend it and the friction that the immersion blender uh, creates will actually warm up your chocolate uh, But another way is to actually take some of your untempered chocolate here and again about We are currently at 40 degrees Celsius. We're gonna put a little bit of that chocolate into our Tempered chocolate to bring that temperature up just a little bit The thing here is that you don't want to put too much or, or else again You are going to take it out of temper so just in that sense, we are at 31.7 degrees Celsius, which is again, a perfect temperature when it comes to working with chocolate. So again, I'm gonna leave it as is. And before I start working on a project, I'm actually going to quickly check if my chocolate is in temper. So I'm dipping a mini offset spatula um, and I'm going to wait. Uh, and within about a minute or two, that chocolate should start to set. If you notice that there are white streaks or slight streaks in your chocolate, that means that it still needs to be tempered a little bit more. So you can uh, put some more uh, chocolate onto the marble and table it, or you can add a little bit of seed. If, however, it forms large, uh, shiny crystals, that just means that your chocolate is now overseeded and uh, is too low at a temperature. So you heat it up back to 32 to melt out those crystals. So. Again, when it comes to uh, reformulating those uh, cocoa butter crystals, if you overseed your chocolate, one, it's usually thicker than uh, chocolate that is uh, properly tempered. Uh, but because you've overseeded, those crystals are just so large that it actually presents itself after or while it cools. So uh, those are important distinctions when it comes to chocolate. Right. So last thing, I don't know if you've seen are there any questions about tempering before I continue. I don't, no, there's not. No worries, all right, perfect. So uh, another product is Micrio. This is actually powdered cocoa butter. And uh, another form of uh, crystallization or another form of tempering is by using Micrio. And the thing here is, is that you actually take 1% of the weight of your chocolate and you add that percentage in. So let's say I weighed out my chocolate to um, 100 grams, right? I bring it down to about 35 degrees Celsius, and then at 35 degrees, I add one gram of Micrio into my chocolate and essentially seed it down to uh, 32. And that in itself showcases, uh, if you will, that you need 1% of its weight in, uh, to again, to temper chocolate. Another way uh, people, again, confectioners, chocolatiers use is uh, easy temper which is essentially uh, cocoa butter that has been turned into a paste, but at the proper temperatures. So you add again 1% of that uh, cocoa butter paste into your chocolate uh, to temper your chocolate properly. So, very quickly, I'm not sure if you can see. This chocolate right here is beginning to set. 
You can see that in the light, it is actually shiny and shimmering, but it is not matte. So that is actually tempered chocolate. As a quick look, here it is, as to the difference here, this is the chocolate that is untempered. I don't know if you, the difference in sheen. This over here is the tempered chocolate. So you actually see that it's not as shiny and is actually setting, whereas this is absolutely shiny because it is not setting at all because it is at 40 degrees uh, Celsius. So again, too hot, not at all tempered. So the difference there is uh, dramatic. So I'm actually gonna let this set and we'll take a look later on. This, this right here, which is the untempered chocolate, will most likely present itself uh, with bloom uh, where it is actually streaks or um, dots. And this again will properly, which has been tempered, will properly, um, if you will, be uh, set. So we'll come back to that in a little bit. Alrighty. So that's essentially what tempering is and is again the difficult part when it comes to chocolate. And as soon as you have mastered how to temper chocolate, um, the sky is the limit when it comes to the chocolate and uh, the uh, projects that you can make when it comes to chocolate. Right? So I'm going to move this over. Where we'll, talk, we'll start talking about bonbon construction or bonbons in general. So, ooh, actually, I wanted to uh, make a ganache with you guys as long as I have time, which I do, which I do. It's only 40 minutes. Amazing. Um, so with that said, ganache recipe. Ganache, what it is. It is essentially a uh, emulsion. Uh, it is the combination of a liquid and a fat. And a, the percentage of each will create a ganache or a system where you can then make a filling for it. Uh, a basic ganache recipe for dark chocolate. Uh, this over here is Karib, which is 66%. Again, which has those, uh, that coffee, that citrus, that, um, um, I'm trying to think, that almond flavor, I was, couldn't think of it. That almond flavor is in this chocolate, which is again, that dark chocolate. And over here is actually some coffee cream, which essentially is cream, heavy cream that I steeped coffee in uh, with some glucose syrup and some salt. Um, and a basic recipe for that is 100 grams of uh, cream or liquid to about 150 grams of uh, chocolate, 10 grams of glucose syrup, and a gram of salt. For the flavoring, I added five grams of coffee and steeped it in the cream for about 30 minutes. So that's that. So this is a great base recipe. Uh, if you wanted to impart other flavors, you could steep uh, cinnamon, you can steep uh, chai tea flavors, um, and so on and so forth for a ganache like this. So very quickly, I'm going to, I've already steeped my cream. I'm actually gonna heat it up just a little bit more, just to, you know, make the emulsion. Off to the side, I have, oh, I'm gonna put it into my uh, chocolate, have it set, and then we're gonna make a uh, ganache. Oop. So there's a slight lag that I noticed on the stream, um, but we're back, so that's that. Uh, but like I said, we have the um, heavy cream in the microwave and uh, chocolate here uh, in front of me in my pint. Heating it up in the microwave, this is gonna be a very small batch, but this is again a basic ganache recipe that you can use for fillings, uh, you know, to frost, uh, you know, fillings for cakes, filling for bonbons, or even uh, to cover your cakes in, so that's that. I'm just checking on our chocolate, which is actually set. Take a look at that in a sec. Okay, if you wanna have a tip when it comes to boiling cream, I'm sure everyone there has actually overboiled their cream before, which sucks, right? The mess that it makes, abhorrent, right? Um, if you ever find yourself boiling cream and it is to the point of almost overboiling, immediately shut the heat off and blow on it. The cold air from your, act, like the cold air will actually help those bubbles dissipate enough. And I have a friend behind me who actually works in the restaurant and she is absolutely agreeing with me and she's laughing right now because she knows it's true. Um, because cream, to be quite honest, is one of those things that you step away from and it just is chaos. Another one is caramel, where like that is one thing that like you step away from for three seconds and it like is burnt, right? So that is just a quick tip for boiling cream uh, at home uh, or at work, whatever it may be. So with that said, chocolate again, 150 grams. In here is 100 grams of cream, five grams of coffee grounds, which again, I steeped for about 30 minutes, 10 grams of glucose syrup and a gram of salt, 
which I'm going to pour over my chocolate. And we're gonna let that sit for about a minute. By letting it sit for about a minute, we're having the hot cream begin to melt our chocolate so that it is easier to emulsify and come together. And for large batches, I actually use a, an immersion blender to shear that fat, shear the liquid into that fat. But for this, since it's a small amount, I'm just going to um, mix it together uh, with a uh, rubber spatula, which I got from Sheila Tab. Um, it's a mini spat, that's what I call it. And it actually is, um, it says Je t'aime Paris. And uh, one of my, uh, some of my coworkers before I left the Modern um, actually got me a set of them, so I still use them to this day. Um, so yeah. So with that said, it has begun to set. It has begun to set or uh, settle. So I'm going to mix the ganache from the center. I'm going to wait for that chocolate to fully emulsify in the center first, and then once it emulsifies in the center, I will then go out uh, to the rest of the actual. Um, pint container to have it fully come together. You can even actually reverse of this is you can actually melt your chocolate first and start with cold cream, also an option. Um, or you can even do melted chocolate and hot cream. So again, it just depends on how you'd like to work with it. Uh, one thing here is you don't really want to use a, uh, a whisk. The problem with the whisk is that you'll start to aerate your ganache. And don't get me wrong, I mean, if you want to do that, that is totally fine. But for a stable ganache that you're gonna use for a filling, you want it to be super smooth uh, and not as aerated. Um, so that's that. But yeah, so right here, come over. This ganache has already come together after subtle mixing. And we see actually that it is, hold on, I'm trying to see if we can get the light. It is shiny and not grainy, not like super broken. And that is what we look for when it comes to a ganache. So that is again a very basic ganache recipe when it comes to dark chocolate. And when I fill bonbons, I'll make ganache like this. I'll put a, a piece of plastic wrap on top and have it uh, put off the side and have it cool down. And when we fill ganaches, um, it should be about 26 degrees to 30 degrees Celsius. If it's any higher when it comes to the temperature, it will take your chocolate out of temper. Uh, which again sucks, um, but yeah. So those are definitely again those little minute details that again come into play when it comes to uh, working with chocolate. Coming back to the tempered chocolate, this over here is the tempered chocolate, and you can actually see how it has already set in this light. This over here, which I'm wiggling right now, is the untempered chocolate. And again, we we dipped each uh, spatula, uh, mini offset, uh, about thirty seconds, minute tops. Uh, in between each other, but we see that this has already set in about a minute or two, which is, or three minutes, which has, uh, you know, since we dipped it, and this is still uh, not set. So that is, again, the difference between tempered and, hold on, tempered, which again, in the light is matte, and untempered chocolate, which is super shiny and still liquid to this point. I can touch the tempered chocolate without it coming on my finger, whereas if I touch the untempered chocolate, again, it is still on my finger. So that's that. So again, I'm gonna let this set so that we can see how it actually comes out with those white streaks, dots, uh, and imperfections um, afterwards. All right, so we're gonna have that set. Christine, if you don't mind, just moving that off to the side. So let's talk about bonbons. So bonbons, I will say, isn't or chocolate confections aren't necessarily a part of cake artistry, but is a good skill to have as a chocolatier, as a pastry chef, as a sugar artist. Uh, and it's great because when it comes to bonbon creations, you can make stuff that is, again, sky, ooh, sky's the limit when it comes to the bonbons that you can create. And the great thing about them is that you can, again, fill them with anything and everything you can think about. So I have a few bonbons here that are filled um, with, again, um, with a ganache filling. This one down here, these blue ones, are filled with a honey caramel uh, with an oat milk ganache. These guys over here, um, again, which is actually mirrors the um, koi fish that we'll see later on is actually a soy sauce uh, ganache. And then these guys are actually a, um, since they're cocoa pods, uh, they're the arguani, which is uh, a Venezuelan chocolate um, ganache. So single origin uh, ganache for that, right? So first of all, bonbons, what we can fill uh, with um, different fillings at this point. So ganache is a traditional way to fill um, bonbons. 
but in modern contemporary uh, bonbons, what we see now is a lot of different kinds of fillings, some of which include aerated confections, marshmallows, uh, honeycomb, uh, others are uh, caramels, gels, uh, cookies or sablés are even uh, used as fillings in these bonbons. And again, in modern contemporary bonbons, when you cut them in half, what you see is are multi-layered uh, bonbons that are, again, super fun. And again, as a pastry chef, as a cake artist, you notice that uh, for a wedding cake, you can make a 10 five-tier cake, cascade sugar flowers, and an amazing filling inside. And it makes a big wow, like, right? That's like, you know, amazing. Plate of dessert, you have a, again, dessert, uh, multi-component, multi you might have, let's say, uh, caramel sauce, um, you know, chocolate, sponge cake, um, Sakura ice cream on the side, whatever it might be. So again, a very wow dish. When it comes to a bonbon, when it comes to something like this, it's, a, it's only a 30 millimeter in diameter bonbon. So there's only so much you can do with one bonbon. So again, that multi-layer component in it um, makes a big difference when it comes to bonbons at this caliber. And to be quite honest, the um, video will never really do it justice but the shine that you get on these guys um, is absolutely gorgeous. Bring it over. So I've taken photos. What? No, that's right. Um, but with that said, over here, you can definitely see how it like sh almost shimmers. This one actually. How they almost shimmer in the light. Can you see that? Hopefully you see that. Hmm. It's all right, I'm gonna post photos. Um, so my friends here actually uh, is a photographer and uh, all my photos recently um, have been, um, have actually been made uh, by my friend Jonan, who's with us today. He actually took photos of the showpiece as well as these bonbons before we uh, started the demo. So um, in a while, you'll definitely see these photos down the line. So, but with that said, um, let's talk about uh, making bonbons. So again, that's the filling which we discussed, which was the ganache. Let's talk about molds. I, ooh, I kept everything near me, as you can see. Um, so I primarily use polycarbonate molds um, when it comes to working with chocolate. And note that there are two main types of molds. First of all, I want to talk about this one, which is a dog. Uh, it's a very traditional, it's a metal uh, mold. And uh, again, metal molds are more traditional, but I got this from uh, Tom Rick. I took a class up in upstate Buffalo, New York, um, where with uh, Chef um, Florent Chavon, who is the... Um, uh, he placed in the uh, World Chocolate Masters competition uh, and I actually got one of these uh, molds from them. So traditional bonbon molds, traditional molds are made out of uh, metal. And to note with chocolate, as it sets, it actually contracts as well. So as chocolate contracts, it actually releases, it releases itself from the mold that you're using. So polycarbonate molds versus thermoform molds. So when it comes to the molds that we see on the market, we either have, again, polycarbonate, or if you will, thermoformed. The difference is that one thermoformed is cheaper. So you usually see this uh, with AC Moore. I remember AC Moore used to be here on Staten Island. Um, I would see these guys, you'd see them on eBay, you see them on, um, you see them on Amazon, you see them at cake stores, whatever it may be. And again, the, one of these guys is about like a dollar, two dollars, three dollars max perhaps, depending on what you have. Uh, and this over here is a polycarbonate mold, much rigid, a little stronger. Problem here is, is that it is 20 bucks, roughly, for each mold. As a confectioner, as a chocolatier, I primarily use polycarbonate molds. The main reason why is because thermoform molds versus polycarbonate, polycarbonate will outlast that of thermoform. That is because these guys are, again, rigid, much stronger, and um, the reason why is because the way these molds are made. Uh, when it comes to thermoformed molds, the way they're made is actually a sheet of plastic that is heated up, and then once it's heated up, it is actually then uh, formed over cavities to build the design. Inside is a vacuum that sucks in the plastic to create those molds. When it comes to polycarbonate molds, it is essentially made between two metal plates with liquid plastic injected between those plates to get, again, a very solid uh, mold, if you will. So again, you can create high quality bonbons, chocolates from either, but the difference again is the fact that this, these molds, the polycarbonate ones, will outlast the ones of thermoform molds. And uh, again, it just depends on your level of usage when it comes to chocolate. Again, as a chocolatier, I use them a lot, so I need these guys to last me a long time. Uh, polycarbonate molds, again, uh, come in a variety of shapes and sizes. So I primarily use uh, demi-spheres, 
cylinders, spheres, so on and so forth. So these guys, as you can see, are about 30 millimeter um, diameter uh, round um, uh, molds from Pavoni. That is the brand that I use. This over here is a Cabrillon uh, from Italy. Uh, both are actually from Italy, uh, Pavoni and Cabrillon. This is about a 20 millimeter in diameter uh, bonbon mold, but is much taller than the actual uh, Pavoni. You can actually see the difference there. Uh, other brands that I use include Chocolate World, uh, which is a Belgian uh, company, as well as, um, I'm trying to think what else do I have. Uh, I'll list some out. I can't think of any right now, but those are primarily some of the mold uh, brands that I use. As for where to buy these molds, um, I personally buy them from uh, you know some you know, restaurant supply stores near me. Very quickly, the chocolate is setting. I just noticed oh, out of the corner of my eye. So just to keep it in temper, I'm going to add a little more heated chocolate so that it doesn't fully set on me. Anyway, so I buy them from restaurant supply stores around me. So if you're in New York City, if you're in uh, the tri-state area here, uh, JB Prince, New York Cake, uh, Karecki's, Baked Deco is a, um, are some companies that sell these uh, molds. Um, you can buy them off of Amazon. Um, Pastry Chef's Boutique is another brand. They're based in New Jersey, and I buy from them, um, honestly. Uh, but yeah, again, you can find these molds anywhere. Uh, just have to look for them. Make sure that you're looking for reputable ones. Uh, and note that polycarbonate molds can come in a variety of uh, colors and, and sizes. So this is a much more, it's a frosted design, a frosted color, so it's white uh, and not fully uh, clear. Some are also blue, so on and so forth. Alrighty. So with that said, I already have some molds that I've already airbrushed. So decorating chocolate. You primarily use uh, colored cocoa butter. These are actually from Chef Rubber. They are a brand that I primarily use to buy cocoa butter colors as well as fat soluble colors. You can either buy your own color or buy colors that are pre-made like these guys over here, or you can actually uh, make your own. You buy uh, cocoa butter straight up, you buy fat soluble colors and you blend them together to make your colors. Best thing about that is that now you have control over the recipe, over the, um, over the uh, color that you're trying to create. Um, so that's that. Same goes with uh, tempering chocolate, tempering because of the cocoa butter. Cocoa butter should be tempered before using to get those nice qualities in it. And that is the reason why these bonbons that I have with me today are, again, super shiny. So again, I'll move them a little bit farther up just so that they're in the frame. Oh yeah, so that's that. Um, I have two molds here that I've already airbrushed already. So one blue with a splatter design, same with this orange splatter design. This mold again is Pavoni, which is that, three, um, if you will, that uh, 30, dia 30 millimeter diameter uh, cylinder. This is actually, if you will, a demi-sphere uh, from Chocolate World. Frank Hasnut is a uh, chocolatier uh, who creates these uh, bonbon size molds. But, so you can see the design that I have. Um, I used an orange dot, uh, splatter white, airbrushed light blue and dark blue, which is seeming to be a signature design of mine uh, for caramel. And then this over here, uh, is just orange with black, uh, or rather brown splattering, which is my, um, if you will, which I associate with uh, hazelnut praline or hazelnut as my flavor profile. So with that said, let us start off by shelling some bonbons, right? So I'll actually do the orange ones right here. Um, and again, we're using the chocolate that we have. And we'll move the cocoa butters over. And I'm going to take a piping bag, right? So. Again, tempered chocolate already here next to me. We're gonna actually pipe chocolate into each mold and we are going to make some shells. There it is. Tina, you know, are there any questions perhaps? Tina Coles Jones asked, how long have you worked with chocolate? Uh, okay, so I started working with chocolate. So thank you, Tina, for the question. I started working with chocolate in 2013. Uh, that was the first year I attended the National Capital Area Cake Show, and one of the free demos was with Chef Susan Otter, and she did a demonstration on um, a chocolate show piece as well. And since then, I've loved it. I remember I got back home, I made a, a very ugly uh, chocolate show piece when I was back at it. I don't know if it's on my Facebook anymore, but uh, hopefully it's not. <laughs> um, but it was absolutely disgustingly ugly, which is fine. Again, we all grow as professionals. But, uh, but yeah, since then I've definitely, chocolate has definitely been a, um, you know, in the backdrop of me working with cake, sugar flowers, 
Um, and I think when I was out in California uh, for as part, a semester away as part of the CIA, my chef instructor, Chef Stephen Durfee, who was the first uh, pastry chef at the French Laundry, uh, he competed at the Coupe du Monde. Um, he really inspired, if you will, me working with chocolate on a much uh, grander scale. And uh, when I, for my last semester at the CIA, uh, one of my last projects that I personally did was I built a seven foot tall chocolate showpiece in my dorm room. Uh, and when I mean in my dorm room, I mean in my actual dorm room, where my suite and my suite mates, all they could tell me is that our room smelled like chocolate for a good 15 weeks. Uh, I, uh, I don't wanna say that I didn't really care that it did, but, uh, but it did. And um, it was something that I built in my room because you know, for this project, at the CIA, you know, chefs, um, you know, they've seen other students make chocolate showpieces with the assistance of the chef instructors there, um, but they've never seen, you know, no one's ever made a seven foot tall chocolate showpiece. Let's just say it as it is. So the fact that I introduced the idea was crazy to some, like, I, I, I'm crazy, I'm a psycho, let's call a spade a spade, I just am. Um, but yeah, I built it in my dorm room and that has definitely been like, wow. And the fact that again, not going to work, being stuck at home uh, because of the current world um, you know, state, uh, the state of the world, I've been able to really um, direct my focus into chocolate right now, which is why it is currently at the forefront of what I do. So yeah, thank you again for the question, Tina. All right, so, fill the bag with chocolate and all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna snip the top go trash and what we're going to do is we are going to pipe chocolate in each cavity and we're going to almost overfill each cavity and then we're going to turn this over to get their shells so I'm gonna shake them all get it settled and with the back of my scraper, I'm actually going to tap out as much of those air bubbles as I can. To keep myself clean, I'm going to scrape all the excess chocolate into our melter. So one solid move, I'm scraping an excess chocolate into the bowl. So it's one scrape and then down to scrape it out. So again, I'm keeping the area clean. Afterwards, I'm going to then turn this over and tap out as much chocolate as I can. So if we're all ready, drum roll, it's okay. We tap it down and we have the chocolate essentially come out of the mold. And this vigorous tapping helps us when it comes to creating thin, thin shells uh, when it comes to our chocolate uh, bonbons. So once everything is uh, out, we will then actually continue to scrape and keep the mold as clean as we can, just so that as we continue our processes, they are actually uh, ready to go. Again, clean as you go. All right, perfect. And the way I'm going to let these cool, actually, are along, excuse me, along confectionery bars. So these are actually half-inch confectionery bars that I bought from Tomrick. And um, what I'm going to do is actually going to set these on my marble. Yeah, I'll actually set it like this so you guys can see. And have the mold elevated. As you can see, it's about half an inch uh, off the surface. The reason why is because, there's molds, here they are. When it comes to chocolate molds, or rather polycarbonate molds, we see this framework that is built along each cavity, this thick piece of plastic that is around it. The thing with chocolate is that there's something called the latent heat of crystallization, which means that the heat from your chocolate can actually result in your chocolate reheating itself up, taking it out of temper. So on a bigger scale, when we think of it, let's think about a chocolate sphere that is uh, built like this for a showpiece, which is gonna be the next thing we're gonna talk about in a sec. The outside area of the, I'm trying to see if I have something. Yeah, we're gonna talk about this in a bit, but let's say this is actually uh, my circle, let's say sphere. The exterior will actually crystallize and harden quicker than that at the center. When we think about sleeping in bed, we have a blanket, right? And the fact that we have a blanket when we're tucked in, that insulated heat will keep us warm. So the fact that all of our chocolate is actually still in there, that internal heat can actually reheat your chocolate past 32 degrees Celsius, leading to your temperature of your chocolate, or rather, rather leading, your, your, leading your chocolate to go out of temper. 
Um, so yes, uh, and that is what is called the latent heat of crystallization, which is why for larger pieces of chocolate, after it crystallizes, I then put it in the fridge so that it promotes the cooling of chocolate, but on a microcosm is this fact of the uh, chocolate shells. If we just put this on our surface, that thick wall that we discussed will act as an insulation to your surface. So the heat will actually be stuck inside your cavity and could potentially take your chocolate out of temper. And that depends on the environment in which you're working. If your environment is um, higher than like 20 degrees Celsius, then you're working in a quite warm environment, which can lead to those problems, uh, which is why we talked about those, um, which is why we, I do this. So by keeping it elevated, it actually continues that airflow in between, cooling the entire mold out so that you have that even cooling. Lastly, um, when you, if you have chocolates, this is the opening, by the way, of the uh, mold. If I have the chocolate or the mold uh, settle like this, you'll have a flat or you'll have your chocolate flush to the actual mold. The problem here is that when you, uh, the last step in making chocolate is capping, which is uh, essentially putting chocolate on the uh, bottom layer so that it seals your chocolate. When we think about a construction of a frame, um, you know, those pieces of the rectangle are not really like flush like this, right? They're actually uh, trapezoidal where there's a 45 degree angle where they actually come flush together. So by having the chocolate set with the openings up, what the force of gravity does is that chocolate as it sets will actually dip a little bit, making a beveled effect. And that beveling will actually help us when it comes to sealing our chocolates um, and capping them. So yeah, I don't know. Uh, with that said, um, we'll move on. If there's any, I don't know, Christina, are there any questions for chocolate? Uh, bonbons, perhaps. Jennifer McRoberts asks, can I use wood and not metal sticks to elevate the pan? Absolutely. Uh, anything that helps elevate, um, so yeah, Jennifer, thank you for your question. You can definitely uh, use anything when it comes to elevating your mold. These are just confectionery bars that I use for uh, trophies construction and so on and so forth, but you can definitely use wooden uh, dowels, uh, textbooks, anything that you can use um, to elevate them. So again, it's all about that circulation of air, to be quite honest. So very quickly, uh, talking about the chocolate that is again tempered. Over here we have our chocolate that is still tempered. So again, it is that shininess to it or that matteness to it. Uh, whereas this is the chocolate that has been untempered and is still very, very shiny and again, sticky and tacky. So that is the difference again when it comes to uh, working with tempered versus untempered. So very quick, I'm gonna check the time as we continue forth. We are at 45 minutes. Marsha, before you go. Oh, yes, okay, so before uh, Marsha, who just quickly asked uh, the recipe for chocolate, or the, for the chocolate ganache filling, again, it is 100 grams of heavy cream, about 35% uh, fat. Note that heavy cream, there are uh, heavy creams that are out there that are 40% fat, which is high. Uh, but again, 100, 100 grams of 35% um, heavy cream, 150 grams of dark chocolate, so again, I used Kareeb, which was 66%. Um, 10 grams of glucose syrup. If you don't have glucose syrup, you can definitely use light corn syrup um, uh, that you can get at like Stop and Shop or at the local grocery store, um, and about a gram of salt. You can definitely add additional flavors. Again, like I did, I added five grams of coffee grounds. You could add a vanilla extract, almond extract. You can add some uh, uh, bourbon, uh, you know, 10 grams of bourbon perhaps. So you have a dark chocolate bourbon ganache. Um, you can even steep your cream with some uh, um, orange zest, if you will, and then you have now an orange cream, add that to your dark chocolate and add some Gramenier, so that again is orange liqueur. So you have those, you have a lot of options, if you will, and if anyone out there uh, at the end has a specific recipe in mind or a specific flavor that they would like me uh, to send over a recipe or help you find a recipe, I am uh, more than happy to do so. So yeah. Right. So with that said, we're gonna reset the station for a little bit. Uh, and then we'll talk about showpiece construction as I still have 40 minutes. So I'm doing quite well on time. Um, so yeah. So chocolate's here. I'm gonna move these molds off to the side. And we're going to talk about showpieces first. So I'm actually gonna move the, hmm. Yes, I've decided what I'm going to do now. Christine, if you don't mind just moving these um, bonbons out of the way for a little bit. Yeah, this dog, by the way, I don't know why, for, I use it for Easter for the first time, and I molded them, three different kinds, I airbrushed them, and I used, um, uh, if you will, a mold, an oval mold to make uh, bunny ears. So instead of, because I don't have a bunny mold, to be quite honest, so instead of making um, Easter bunnies, I made Easter dogs, and um, they were still pretty cute, so that was that. So yes, all right, 
So, we're gonna move everything over as we talk about show pieces. I'm gonna move my show pieces, I'm gonna hold my breath, and hope that the two show pieces that I brought with me today do not come shattering down. First one. <laughs> that was not the show piece, so we're good there. This one's our... That was actually not on purpose. I'm gonna re... I'm gonna re oh. I just rewatched the playback of it. Amazing. So, with that said, this is our show piece Right here. We'll talk about this one in a sec. We keep this off to the side. All right. With that said, next one. Let's let's pray for this one. <laughs> my friend off to my left said she is scared, and I am too as well. That hurts. That hurt? Yeah. I mean, okay. Ho hold on. I don't know if anyone out there who competes. First of all, um, I'm not sure if you have a, uh, a an affection to your show pieces. I do not at this point, uh, to be quite honest. Um, there was a showpiece that I made for the National Capital Area Cake Show for 2018, and I entered it in the Ohio Convention. I'm not sure if anyone out there remembers the Ohio in Cincinnati, that convention. I had a demonstration where I had posturized paper airplanes. And before I left uh, Cincinnati, outside the convention hall, in the parking lot, I actually crushed, I stepped on the showpiece and left it out in the parking lot to die. So yes, at this point, I am no longer as uh, affectionate to my showpieces. The best thing about chocolate is that since it breaks, you just have to remelt it and rework with it. So not that bad. Um, but yeah, this showpiece that just broke, I made in May. So uh, again, I'm not as distraught as I would be, um, you know, had I made it today. And plus I already have photos of it, which is more important in my mind. So I'm totally fine that it broke today because uh, I wasn't gonna bring it home. All right, so with that said, wow. If the, I'm very surprised because the funniest thing is that yesterday or earlier today, I thought about this exact scenario and I jokingly was like, what if it happens? And I'm like, I'm not gonna make it happen, but you know, whatever. Um, when it comes to show pieces, uh, when you're building it, first of all, this is a, what, Actually, you know, I'm gonna move the carnage because you know. <laughs> um, we'll focus on the one showpiece that's actually still standing. I'm gonna move all this over. Hopefully, that's good. Uh, but yeah, over here with me, as I hold my breath, is my is the one showpiece I still have with me today. And this was actually the showpiece that I built specifically for this demo, if you will. Um, and I uh, have aptly called it koi because of the koi fish uh, as the focal point. When it comes to showpiece construction, one of the biggest thing is, first of all, uh, showpiece, the reason why I started this demo with bonbon work is because to build showpiece, showpieces like this, there's a need for a great understanding of how chocolate works in general, which is why in those bonbons, uh, it is a quick microcosm or a small look of chocolate. Over here, um, chocolate showpiece construction, uh, again, sky's the limit as to what you can create. And inspiration for me primarily comes from nature, organic look, uh, Asian cultures, and is you know truly what I work with, and is again seen throughout here on the showpiece uh, today. And the thing with showpieces is that again there are three main types of showpieces for us as sugar artists. One is uh, chocolate, uh, blown sugar, and uh, passage work. Uh, Sydney Galperin again has uh, brought up to the forefront the idea of blown sugar isomalt work. Whereas, uh, you know, chocolate and pastillage are not seen as much. So, again, that is why I talk about chocolate show pieces a lot, if you will. Um, and, again, the core fundamentals is knowing how to temper chocolate. Tempering, again, we get those nice qualities in chocolate, but, again, we discussed when that fat or when those crystals are together, it is absolutely strong and, um, if you will, much more sturdier. So, similar to building a building, this idea of tempered chocolate being much more structurally sound is important to, um, important to discuss. Um, I'm gonna quickly move, one sec, the rest of the carnage over here before we continue. <laughs> All right, perfect. That was slightly annoying me, Feel. All right, back to show pieces. When it comes to chocolate, that is, our chocolate show pieces, um, 
there is a need to know when to cut your losses, if that makes sense. Uh, by that, I mean, if I'm building the base and I hear a crack or a subtle shift, whatever it may be, it is important at that point to accept that, it, that something is off. Uh, and it is important to, um, if you will, assess that issue at that point, because if there's something wrong with the base and you build up your showpiece, however, you know, tall, it will come crashing down because the base is not sound. Um, so it's important in that sense, um, you know, when it comes to chocolate showpiece work. And when it comes to uh, showpieces in general, specifically for chocolate, uh, there's a flow or a need for flow. So I'm gonna bring the camera a little bit further up so that you guys can see the piece a little bit more as I move the random stuff over. I'm gonna slowly move the camera. I'm gonna see, let's see if that works, first of all. I think that's enough, let's see. Hmm, a little bit more. Don't mind me as I'm trying to figure out everything that's going on. Christine, were there any reactions? The chocolate showpiece breaking. I'm excited to hear, first of all. <laughs> Tina Cruz said, oh my. Yes, Tina, very, very much oh my. Um, but yeah, it's totally fine. I'm, I'm absolutely used to that. Um, that project that I talked about where I made a seven foot tall showpiece, at the end of the project, I pushed it off the table and my entire class cheered as it was a cathartic motion as we were absolutely uh, relieved that our project was complete, if you will. All right, so with that said, this is, I'm seeing right now on the, on the playback that is much closer so you guys can see it. But when it comes to showpiece construction, there's a need for flow. Uh, and you know, as you can see right now, there's a very S design uh, to the showpiece. So, um, and it's a very forced uh, flow. And um, you as the chocolatier, you as the sugar artist, you as the uh, showpiece constructor, uh, create that flow, if you will. So behind everything here is actually a structured piece. So you see that gray um, rectangular prism that's curved around. That's the skeleton of the piece and everything that has been added on, the koi fish, the vines, the cattails, have all been added to create or simulate that flow um, for the rest of the piece. Um, use of color is great uh, because when it comes to show pieces, you want to have like your focal point. Um, had we had the other piece, we have a quick uh, comparison as to the focal points of each, but for this one specifically, your eye, uh, and again, first of all, again, when it comes to... Your life video has ended. Let's take a look. Hmm. Very quickly. Oh. It's working for... Let's take a look. It's working for us. Oh, all right. For some reason, the uh, playback cut out for a split sec. But anyway, um, first of all, everyone's uh, if you will, I or perception of art is different. Clearly, art is um, subjective. Everyone has their own opinions as to how everything looks. So definitely same, similar aspect here. Um, color use, design, so on and so forth. But in essence, when, I'm making, when I made the showpiece, you have one, your eye goes to one of two things. Either it goes to the koi fish, right over here, or it goes to the um, Asian calligraphy or Chinese calligraphy here. Uh, first of all, that means I love you, by the way, just so that everyone knows uh, what it is. But again, that is essentially what your eye goes to because those are your focal points of the piece. And how your flow is built will then force your uh, viewer's eye into a different way. Um, so again, I start at the koi fish. I can, my eye can either go down into this curve or it actually goes up uh, with the rest of the piece. So again, it depends on how you are going for your showpiece. So your focal point can be a chocolate flower, can be a sculpted piece, a, um, hand, a cocoa butter painting, which was the, um, oh, which was the actual, um, if you will, uh, which is the, um, I lost my train of thought. Hmm. Oh, uh, which can actually be the focal point, a cocoa butter painting could actually be the uh, focal point as well which is the focal point on the other piece that uh, died, if you will. Um, but yeah, so with that said, um, yeah, I mean, so different skills that we'll, we can talk about uh, in a sec here. The koi fish itself is actually an egg mold. That was the start of the actual piece where um, I started off with an egg and then I um, actually 
molded some chocolate or made it into a chocolate clay. Distinction is that it was not modeling chocolate. Modeling chocolate, again, is chocolate mixed with uh, light corn syrup, which then becomes into almost like a sugar or chocolate clay. I'm talking about uh, actual chocolate that you can actually blend up in a food processor or a um, food chopper. And then because you are chopping it, you are not taking, you're not melting it, so it doesn't come out of temper, which is why it is malleable, but is not, um, uh, it won't bloom, if you will. And that is actually what I used to make the head and make the tail. The fins itself, I spread chocolate along confectionery bars, which I then added onto the fish, airbrushed it, uh, and then again, decoed it. Um, going back to that molded chocolate or that modeling paste, um, the vines that you see going around, uh, from the brown ones, to the black ones, to the cattails, the main stems, the main vines are all um, modeled chocolate. Again, Robocood uh, put, put in a food processor to make that modeling paste so that it's more malleable. When we think about, uh, think about uh, if anyone's ever made croissants or laminated dough, puff pastry, danishes, um, and so on and so forth, think about the butter block that you're doing. You are essentially taking butter, you're pounding it out, you're making it malleable, but you're not melting it enough that it degrades into a liquid butter. It is more uh, of a, again, malleable uh, fat, malleable uh, butter block. And same goes for chocolate where it is more malleable. Um, hmm, there's an emptiness, if you will. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fill the emptiness <laughs> with a bag of chocolate. Letitia asked how long it took to make. Make uh, the pieces? Okay, so uh, Letitia, was it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so Letitia, uh, quick question was the, uh, uh, how long did this take me? So first of all, I actually wasn't planning on making this piece specifically for this demo. I was gonna make a very like run of the mill, very traditional show piece. Uh, and I worked on it. I was like 60% of the way done, 70% of the way done. And then I think Wednesday night or Thursday morning, I was like, no, I wanna make a totally different piece. So instead of finishing the original piece, I melted it down and built this guy or built this piece for today. And I am absolutely enthralled and in love with this piece. Uh, and I'm excited that I did this piece more so than uh, the other one. Because again, th the fact that this is all chocolate is again, I think is a testament to like, wow, you can, the, the amount of like stuff that you can make with chocolate is absolutely um, uh, amazing, if you will. Um, but yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, but with that said, chocolate show pieces can take days, weeks, months to create, to be quite honest. Uh, when it comes to like that um, seven foot tall show piece, the show piece that I made for school, that took me a whole semester, if you will, almost 15 weeks to build, again, in my dorm room, along with classes, jobs, so on and so forth. Uh, last month, month and a half ago, I made another chocolate show piece, seven feet tall, in my house, and that took me about a week, um, uh, you know, to create, and this, again, has taken me two days. But I will say, uh, being still young, I don't, I don't really have a full eight hours of sleep, so that is a thing to consider as well. Um, but yeah, about cutting, uh, cutting your losses with your chocolate, by the way, discussing about that seven foot tall show piece. Um, you know, if you can definitely take a look on my profile, the latest big show piece I was with, um, and being seven foot tall, it was a screen door essentially. And it was two separate parts of the screen door. But my original thought was I'm going to make one solid screen door where it was actually going to be a almost five feet tall piece of chocolate, um, you know, assembled into pieces, but in one major thing. Um, and as I was working with it, it already started to break. And at that point I just cut my losses because it had so many breakages or breakage points that it was not worth it to, to continue. So what I did is I actually, um, scrapped that idea. And instead of building one big screen door, I made eight different panels that made the screen door, uh, which were about, about uh, 18 inches in length each. And again, I built it up to make that seven feet tall, um, height, if you will. So I'm gonna move this over, still holding my breath. Um, move the chocolate over. So let's talk about uh, chocolate molds or chocolate tools that you can use for making uh, chocolate show pieces. If I can find the box right here. All right. So when it comes to molds, you can definitely use um, a wide variety of items to make your chocolate pieces. You can definitely go out there and buy all these different molds that you can find. Uh, the Chicago School of Mold Making uh, has a line of uh, what they call showstoppers, which are essentially silicone molds that are uh, the size of a full sheet tray. 
you can, they're already pre-made into like the design, the theme, and uh, you can make show pieces from that. Problem is, is that each of those mats, again, full sheet, is about $300, which again, depending on if you are always making show pieces, can either be something that you'll always use or never use. So that's that. First thing from the Chicago School of Bowl Baking, since we're talking about it, is a silicone noodle. So again, this is a, what is this? I don't know, is it five feet? Yes. I have to check my height in comparison to the noodle. It is a five foot tall or five foot long silicone noodle. That's what they call it. They sell either these, again, five feet or uh, about in 12 inches. And again, you can see it is actually a rectangular prism that is, again, a flexible piece of silicone that you can use to create different designs for your mold. So did I use this? Yes. No, yes, I did use this for this piece, uh, for the, um, if you will, uh, curvature skeleton on the piece. So let's see if you can see it. So, you, yeah, you can definitely see it. When it comes to the silicone um, uh, noodle, you can definitely, again, make different designs for it. And now you have this, if you will, uh, cavity or well, where you can, uh, if you will, uh, pour chocolate into and uh, create your molds. So that's one design. You can again, even if you had uh, several of these, you can make again like these weird organic shapes uh, when it comes to your chocolate. Uh, again, you have that almost like a butterfly wing, if you will, uh, if you wanted, you know, like uh, teardrops, two individual teardrops. Uh, but if you had multiple of these, again, you can make a long piece. You, if you had another one right here, uh, and so on and so forth. I know uh, Sydney Galpern, uh, you know, Sydney Cakes, they sell uh, small uh, versions of this. And again, I'm sure there are other silicone uh, noodles out there that you can buy as well. So that is one um, item that you can use for uh, silicone, or rather for chocolate uh, construction for showpieces. Another one, still with silicone, are these uh, spears from Pavoni. This is essentially a two-piece mold, uh, which makes a sphere. Uh, there's a well or a hole in the, in the center that you can pour your chocolate in, and it's, this will actually create a, uh, again, chocolate sphere. Great thing about this sil the silicone um, constructed pieces is that you can use them for chocolate or casted sugar, ice malt, uh, and so on and so forth. So those are definitely invaluable to use. You can also use rings, tart rings, PVC pipes, PVC um, uh, uh, designs to, again, use for a lot of your... Um, pieces. So the base over here that we see is actually a um, short disc that I use a PVC pipe for. But again, you could definitely use a uh, ring or taut ring like we see over here for um, the showpiece. So that's that. Uh, other things to consider is, is again, if we're, uh, if you want to use polycarbonate molds, there are polycarbonate molds like we saw earlier on. These large ones. Uh, so if I wanted to make a uh, demi-sphere, half-sphere dome of about, what is this? Uh, three inches, two inches, two and a half inches uh, in diameter, uh, that could also work for us. Um, but for more specific designs or details, leaves. I'm not sure if we still have that piece. Let me take a look. Yes. On the carnage that we see here, I'm not sure if it's in frame, um, we have a leaf over here which is made out of chocolate as well. And you can definitely, again, go for uh, buying a specific mold for your chocolate leaves, chocolate designs, but again, it may not be conducive to you uh, specifically, price point wise, and so on and so forth. If you have, if you make sugar flowers, you can actually make, you can use your veiners um, to make uh, chocolate leaves, chocolate petals. So that is an option as, uh, you know, making chocolate show pieces. But even these guys, which you can buy from uh, Michael's, AC Moore, Joann's, your local art supply store, you can buy these um, faux plants, faux leaves, made out of plastic, and then you brush your chocolate on the back and you can create this leaf. So this leaf over here on this piece is actually from, um, you know, f again, from a leaf from, uh, uh, from Michael's, if you will. And Michael's is one of those stores that is, you know, uh, always, if you will, a good lifesaver for us. Uh, as cake artists, sugar artists, and so on and so forth. So I have three main designs here. Uh, the important thing to note is that these leaves, so again, if you're gonna choose them from Michaels, you have to make sure that they are thick and durable. So I'm gonna crush this up, if you will, but it will still form its shape. So this is a thicker plastic. Same goes for this guy. Again, you can see how like sturdy or rigid it is, uh, and as well as this one. There are leaves out there that are super thin that will not um, adhere, if you will, um, to the designs that we're going for. 
and it, it's important to note that the backing, um, the veining, if you will, has to be predominant enough so that it can show itself on the chocolate so that it's not just, you know, um, a leaf, if you will, um, for your showpiece. Um, so that's that. And, um, oh, if you also do not have any of these tools, you can actually mold chocolate on paper. So the thing here is what you can do is you can actually cut poster board strips or poster board paper, cut into strips, and you can actually make those as your walls of your chocolate. You can actually set your chocolate on paper. The difference here is that depending on what you use, your chocolate will be either super matte or super dull, but it can still be in temper. If you mold chocolate in plastic polycarbonate molds, there's a high likelihood that your chocolate will be super shiny. And, and if you, however, mold chocolate on paper, cardstock, like these guys, it will most likely be uh, super matte. Um, and that is, the, that is the case there. Um, and that is the idea when it comes to um, molding chocolate um, for uh, showpiece construction. So when it comes to showpieces, it's not as, let's say, um, essential to mold it in polycarbonate molds, but is an option um, for you guys out there. Right. So with that said, we're going to move some of these guys out. And with, let me check the time that I have. Oh, perfect. Um, I know Jan earlier today did a quick demo on um, chocolate flowers. But with that said, I just wanted to um, add a little bit more, if you will, to that. I'm gonna take out all my tools, my knives out here. So yeah, like I said, if any of you guys have uh, silicone veiners, uh, molds already for um, uh, ice malt, those are all um, fair game for chocolate. Um, you just wanna make sure that the piece of, um, uh, that you're using, if you will, is you know, porous enough that your chocolate will set on it. Move these guys and these leaves out of the way. And lastly, before I continue, the last thing I wanna bring up is this special tool over here, which is a surform. You can buy this at your local um, Home Depot, Lowe's, whatever it is. And this has actually become a very invaluable tool when it comes to working with chocolate showpieces. Uh, it actually is a uh, wood shaver, but it, it is essentially a chocolate shaver. Um, and it allows me to smooth out my chocolate, especially if there are um, imperfections that uh, are un, uh, undesirable. So since again, this is already dead over here, let's say, um, hmm, let's say this corner right here, I wanted to round, round that out, right? A little bit more. I can actually take my surform and actually scrape and using a round mo rounded motion, I can actually round out that corner as you can see right there. So again, it is a very invaluable tool when it comes to sculpting, when it comes to just making showpiece construction, so on and so forth. Uh, if you don't have one of these, you can definitely use a uh, vegetable peeler. Uh, just note that a vegetable peeler can sometimes be a little more abrasive and uh, will be a little more, um, uh, it won't be as smooth if you will. So just keep an eye out when you're using that for showpieces. So I'm gonna put that on the side. Since we're talking about it already, as we look at the carnage that is this piece, uh, this was actually the focal point of the actual piece. It is a Sampigita flower, which is the national flower of the Philippines, again, in Philippine heritage. What I did here is actually cocoa butter painting. So Michelle Boyd is actually a great sugar artist who does that uh, in earnest. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I took a class with her back uh, a few years ago and uh, doing cocoa butter painting has also uh, elevated the piece uh, and it can be a skill that you uh, use as well. Uh, going back to that modeled chocolate, again, to make the vines to uh, create the koi fish, you can again sculpt items like this. Unfortunately, our two dancers here, again, are uh, unfortunately not as, um, you know, to get together <laughs> anymore. I know the heads are gone. But again, um, you can do milk chocolate, white chocolate, or dark chocolate blending it together to get, again, the ability to sculpt chocolate. And again, this is real chocolate, not modeling chocolate. That is the distinction there. Alrighty. As I... Alrighty. So, coming back to the chocolate uh, we have with me, we can actually... Let me just bring it back a little bit. We can actually make petals with anything. So, I call the... Essentially, these are knife point petals. That's a good... Uh, uh, word use for them um, as I have my wide array of tools with me here offset spatula clearly uh, these three over here are um, palette knives from an art store 
uh, again, different designs, different sizes. Uh, again, different uh, to create these nice point petals. These are from Pavoni. Uh, again, that Italian brand that I get molds from. They are specifically feather uh, knives, offsets, if you will. So you dip your chocolate in, you put it down, and you get that design. Um, Frank Hasnut, again, is a, uh, 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 if you will, chocolatier. He's actually created a, um, an, an array where it's similar to this, where it has multiple uh, of these pieces. So you can dip it into your chocolate and you can make like 10 feathers, 10 petals at a time. So that is an option for you. But note that you don't even use just like knives. So I have a paring knife over here, as well as this odd knife, to be quite honest, it's like uh, an oyster shucker, if you will, uh, I think but it just had this nice design that I liked uh, when it comes to uh, knives that you can dip in your chocolate and create petals with. So, so just so that we have a quick look on that, I'm gonna dip some of, these, uh, some of these knives into our chocolate so we can see how they look in each. So you can do this again um, to make chocolate flowers, chocolate leaves, whatever it may be. And again, I'm just setting this on paper I'm gonna do a few of them, not all of them, just so that we can see again the different um, designs that you can get when it comes to these palette knives that we have with us. Let's see. Christine, do you think there, there are any questions you think? Um, Marsha asked, how do you travel with them? Oh, traveling? Ooh, what a great question. <laughs> traveling with chocolate showpieces. Um, it is absolutely much more stressful than any chocolate, or rather than any cake that you can think about. Cause like you, again, I live in New York City, right? In, on Staten Island. And I primarily go to the National Capital Area Cake Show where I've brought chocolate showpieces before, but nothing on the scale of this. If I were to bring this uh, on the Jersey, New Jersey Turnpike, and you know, the highways down in DC and the potholes through New York City, there is no way that this piece would have made it. And again, I, I traveled with this piece and that piece uh, from my house, which is about 10, 15 minutes away from here, which is my friend's kitchen, uh, still on Staten Island. Um, and the level of uh, uh, concern I had traveling with this is egregious, if you will. Uh, every little bump, every turn is like much more than anything you can feel. But um, if I were to, let's say, bring this piece, which maybe down the line, uh, if I were to bring a piece like this to the National Capital Area Cake Show, I would have to bring it in pieces uh, where, like, say, like the skeleton is built, the wave and that main skeleton, but all the details like the leaves, the uh, writing, the fish, the um, lily pads and all that stuff would have to be um, attached just before I entered the uh, actual show yet. Yeah. Were there any other questions? How did you, uh, Carrie asked, how did you make your models out of chocolate? Mm -hmm. Ah, so Carrie, right? Was it? Mm -hmm. Carrie asked uh, models for chocolate. So when it comes to that, um, to those models, similar again, we robocooed or we uh, put the chocolate in a food processor to make it into like a chocolate clay. Again, distinction, not modeling chocolate, real chocolate. Um, and, you know, just using sculpting tools, if you will. Um, at that point, you can, you can essentially treat it as if it were gum paste, uh, fondant, uh, passage, modeling chocolate, but note that it is still real chocolate. Note that if you have warm hands, you might have um, difficulties uh, working with it uh, because you're essentially taking it out of temper, you're melting it uh, in your hand. But again, that is essentially uh, the way to treat it. So very quickly, as you can see, I used the offset spatula, two of my palette knives, and two of the knives from uh, Pavoni's line of um, feather makers. So we see here, I have de definitely different designs. We have a more straight petal, uh, miniature petals for mini flowers. And again, we have almost like a leaf uh, and then more of a like lily uh, petal there, which again, it can be used for making chocolate. I can then, let's say make a, a dozen of these, um, curve it over a uh, tart ring or a PVC pipe. And again, let that set. And now I have petals of different designs for chocolate, um, you know, chocolate flowers, if you will. So that, th that's just a quick look on uh, some of these chocolate tools that I primarily use. If anything, the last thing I will bring up, because I know I am winding down on time. 15 minutes. Yeah, so 15 minutes, um, is spreading chocolate. 
um, which is an invaluable skill for uh, making uh, chocolate work, if you will. So give me one sec. Should just clear everything out. My chocolate is also uh, set a little, a little too much, so I'm actually going to put it on the heat uh, just to melt out a little bit more. So I'm going to have that melt a little bit. Uh, I'm going to move some of these guys over. Note, by the way, if you look on all my on all my chocolate show pieces, I have my seal on it. Okay, just didn't want it to break. I have my seal on it. If you have a wax seal at home, you can actually use that as part of your chocolate. And if it has your signature, has your initials, whatever it may be, what you can do is actually put that seal in the freezer for about an hour. You can temper chocolate, pipe some chocolate on some paper or on a silicone mat, whatever it may be, a little dot like if it were wax. Put the seal on top of your chocolate, let it set, and then it will actually create your seal. I brushed mine with um, some uh, gold dust, if you will. So again, it can, you know, that is the signature of my show pieces. Each of my show pieces will always have uh, my seal on it. So that's just a quick look on, uh, you know, for that. So, very quickly, as the chocolate is still uh, coming together, what I mean by spreading chocolate is essentially spreading it along confectionery bars back on the marble. All right, so these confectionery bars, again, the reason why I use them is to essentially spread chocolate. So what we do with these confectionery bars, and we'll talk about this in a sec, actually, is we lay them out, melted chocolate in, and we spread the chocolate, and these bars allow us to have an even thickness. Um, you know, about, a, about, again, half an inch, quarter of an inch, however these bars, however tall these bars are. If we look at the pieces that, I've ha that I have with me, this piece specifically, have these archways, if you will, or arch designs. All of these have actually been spread along confectionery bars, the red, the yellow, and the blue. And then after they've been spread out on, along these confectionery bars, as it sets, I cut them into triangles, if you will, and then have them set over a uh, ring um, so that it forms that shape. After it's together, I then uh, build the actual full piece to make it as it looks right there. Similar way is actually the wave. You can see the wave here for this showpiece. Um, I spread it along a uh, few confectionery bars in a very like tra uh, trapezoidal design like you see right now. And then as it sets, as it hardens, I actually curled it up, put it in a PVC pipe so that, that this end right here would be a little more curved, and then had this actually come over the table have it set so that it has, again, that uh, wave design that we see over here. So, um, last thing, as the chocolate, again, is uh, heating up, this over here is a piece of granite that is made out, entirely out of chocolate, which is a very easy base to create for, uh, uh, for as a chocolatier. Um, again, we see the comparison uh, between the granite um, on the actual table and this, not necessarily, again, uh, perfect, but this was just a quick design. To make this, essentially, you are taking chocolates um, that you have, you are chopping it up as small as you can, and then as it is still in piece form, you actually fold it into your melted chocolate, white chocolate, dark chocolate, whatever it may be. You have it set, that, oh, first of all, that chocolate is tempered. You have it set in a ring, and then when it you know, crystallizes, you take an iron, uh, or let's say a hot pan or whatever it is, you're melting a, um, that veneer off of the actual chocolate to reveal this design that you have. And the best thing is, is that the smaller the pieces that you cut, the more detailed you can get. So this is again, um, you can see there are, uh, we have some milk chocolate, we have some dark chocolate, we have some of that dulce, uh, caramelia. Uh, again, there's little uh, different kinds of chocolates in this one base, which is again, very easy to make, which uh, can elevate your design for your piece. So I mean, like again, this is the base that I have. If I were to move this, let's see. if I were to move my showpiece, one, two, up, onto my base, you now have, oh, you don't really see it, you now have that nice uh, excess or extra design uh, onto your showpiece, which is a nice, uh, again, touch for the entire thing, if you will. Um, very quickly as well, note that um, I am not a vendor. I do not sell anything that I, uh, any of the tools that I have. 
However, as part of this demo, uh, I have added a, a uh, code, if you will. Uh, I do sell um, some used um, molds uh, and some chocolate tools. Note that, again, some of these chocolate tools are quite expensive. Some of those molds, like I discussed, are about 20 bucks each. Uh, there's nothing wrong with them. Uh, it, is just, it just so happens that those designs are no longer, um, I don't use them as much, to be quite honest. And perhaps if anyone out there is interested, you can certainly uh, send a message, shoot a message to me here on, on Facebook or on Instagram. Um, and uh, you know, I can send you uh, the pictures of those uh, molds, those tools, if any of you are interested in uh, grabbing a few chocolate tools at a lower price, uh, that is also an option. You just have to reference, I believe the code was um, chocolate, uh, spelt as, you, as it sounds, so C-H-A-W, uh, C-O-L-A-T-E. Wow, that was like, much difficult than it should have been. Uh, Icy's Chocolate, I believe it was, but honestly, if you message me about that, then clearly I know that you uh, were at this demo. So yeah, and again, it is just some tools I uh, have access of, so when it goes, it goes, but if you send that code, I'll um, throw in a free shipping and uh, something extra, so that's that. So if anyone's interested, that is also an option. So, very quickly, as our chocolate is melting right here, uh, it is overseeded at this point my chocolate, which is why we have those big chunks of chocolate, which is what I'm trying to melt out. Um, but yeah, so I'm gonna wait on that, and as my time elapses, um, that is something that I'll quickly share. But yeah, Christina, are there any other questions? Jennifer asked, do you want your seal to be in the front of your showpiece for competition? No. <laughs> which Jennifer asked that out of curiosity? Jennifer McRoberts. Ooh, okay, so first of all, Competition and uh, making projects at home is very different. As an IC certified judge, uh, I will highly recommend not putting your seal, your name, or anything that like will say that it's you who made it on your piece. Um, you know, it is it is our duty, if you will, if we are judging a category and we notice a piece that we uh, think is a specific sugar artist, cake artist we actually have to recuse ourselves from uh, judging that, uh, if you will, that, uh, um, judging that category or that division. Uh, so on competitions, no, I would not put my seal, uh, nor you, will you see my seal on chocolate show pieces at future composite, uh, competitions. So, yeah. Are there any other questions, Christine? Anna Kalvar asked, will you finish making the bonbons? Um, who is that, I'm sorry, Amy? Anna. Anna. So unfortunately, Anna, I'm not gonna be able to finish the bonbons today. Um, again, this was just a very overarching look uh, on chocolate. Um, if you're interested, I can definitely send you a little more uh, details um, you know, as to how to finish those bonbons. Um, but essentially the shells are made, uh, our filling is made. What we'd have to do is essentially just pipe the um, chocolate uh, filling ganache into our shells. The problem there is, is that you need to make sure when you fill your bonbons, I actually have my bonbons set for about eight to 10 hours. The reason why is because chocolate actually contracts as we discussed and same goes for the ganache. If, you're, if you fill your bonbons with ganache that isn't set and you cap them, there's a risk that your ganache filling will actually contract inside your bonbon mold, uh, forming a sinkhole into your chocolate. And that is something that I've seen in my chocolates, high fat chocolates. I made a, I made a sesame oil ganache before in, those, like, uh, in that dome design it looks fine, it comes out, but then let's say after two days of it just being out, it essentially starts to uh, just break, and again, you see this crater inside the, uh, the chocolate. So unfortunately, I will not be finishing them, but, uh, but that's essentially what we still have to do is fill them, let them set, cap them, and release them. So those are your uh, steps, if you will, to finishing them. Right. Are there any more, Christine? No. Nope. nope, all right. So I am going to quickly check our chocolate, which is, it is still a little overseeded, if you will, uh, but with time running out, I don't want to not discuss this. So first of all, our chocolate is, I was, someone was tempering behind uh, the whole time, but we can see that it's overseeded. It's a little chunkier. Oh, you, you literally just saw that big chunk right there. Um, but yeah, it's definitely not as smooth as it can be. So, you know, just for a, you know, for the principle for knowing what it is, uh, what we're going to do as I almost dropped the chocolate, which would not be fun. Um, I'm going to spread them along our confectionery bars uh, right here. So just as a quick, like, you know, look, if you will, uh, I'm going to essentially pour my chocolate over my, con uh, in between my confectionery bars. Again, let's, we won't mind any of the chunks. Um, 
But note that what I would do, what I have underneath this, is actually a sheet of acetate that I've actually uh, adhered to the uh, marble, so that when we release it, we get that shiny finish, but again, it isn't stuck to the actual marble itself. Um, so again, your chocolate will be out, and then with a scraper, so by the way, I do have an excess of scrapers also, so these scrapers are about 20 bucks um, a pop, so again, if you're interested, um, you know, I have used ones that we can definitely, uh, have here. so very quickly, um, as I spread, I'm essentially spreading the chocolate over, back and forth, just so that it is even, or just so that we have a better look on them. Uh, spread the chocolate, Ooh, spread the chocolate. So again, we have these big seeds that we see here, but uh, which is un, uh, not ideal. Um, but this is essentially the idea that we have, and as it sets, we'll actually release the chocolate from the bars, we'll have a knife, cut it down the, uh, the edges, and then we can actually either cut forms, cut pieces out, or we can actually form this on a ring, a curved board, whatever it may be, um, to create, again, these archways that we see here, the skeleton, or rather the wave that we see here as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, chocolate, to be quite honest, again, is a world of its own, and even in a two-hour demo, that is uh, only a fraction of what we can talk about when it comes to chocolate. Um, uh, you know, it's, again, like I said, an overarching view, and I hope um, some, you know, the reason why I like teaching and the reason why I love ICs is the fact that like the whole concept of it is, is that as sugar artists, we are sharing our knowledge when it comes to sugar artistry, uh, cake artistry, pastry, chocolate, whatever it may be. And that the fact that we are able to share that is a great uh, opportunity for us. And you know, for those of you who may not know who I am, I'm only 21 right now. Um, so I'm fairly young when it comes to my age uh, as a uh, chocolatier, as a sugar artist, as a pastry chef. Um, but my biggest philosophy is, is that at, no matter what point we are in our career, we should always see ourselves as being in the middle. Um, through that perspective, we acknowledge that there's always going to be something, someone in front of us who is ahead of us. That something could be a new skill, a new, um, new technique, a new design, whatever it may be, that we want to strive to learn. That someone who's ahead of us could be a chef that we look up to, um, you know, that we want to become, uh, that we aspire to become, whatever it may be. But with the perspective of being in the middle, we also acknowledge uh, that there is someone behind us, which is, you know, which is sometimes easy to forget. And those people behind us can be a young chef, young artist, uh, young sugar artist, cake artist, um, a pastry chef even, who we as you know, sugar artists um, essentially can inspire with our work. And that is why I love uh, doing demonstrations, doing uh, teaching classes, uh, which is why I love the core ideal of ICs. And uh, I actually was not going, I wasn't planning on attending um, this year's convention in Reno because of timing and scheduling, but certainly the idea or, you know, the fact that we have all been thrusted into a position, something that we haven't thought of, uh, you know, as a world pandemic has certainly given perspective to a lot of what we do and uh, has given me the opportunity to focus on chocolate, which is why uh, I'm happy to share that with, that with you guys today. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, if there's, just note that uh, like I said, this isn't just the cut of the demo. Uh, if you have any other questions down the line, you can certainly message me, add me on Facebook here, uh, Daniel Joseph Corbus. Uh, I use Instagram primarily, so if you'd like, you can certainly follow me on Instagram at, at Daniel Corpus. Uh, you can tell that it's me because my entire page is primarily chocolate, um, so that won't be a surprise to you guys. Um, but yeah, if there's any questions about chocolate, about even pastry, about working in the industry that any of you would like to uh, know, please certainly reach out. I'm happy to help uh, in any way that I can. So, but yeah, I mean, Chrissy, how much time do I still have? Out of curiosity. Um, you're at 157. Oh, so, so, so three, three minutes? minutes? Okay, so I have three minutes. I'm not going to waste those three minutes. Uh, but I hope, for the first of all, I hope that you guys, everyone out there who's uh, uh, tuning in, uh, enjoys the rest of the weekend uh, in the sense of the Cake Expo. There's a lot of artists, cake artists, sugar artists, pastry chefs out there who are absolutely knowledgeable in their craft, who are, again, um, you know, talking about business aspects, talking about sugar artistry, and it's a great resource to have uh, when it comes to chocolate. Um, but yeah, were there any other questions? Last second questions, Christine. Mm, I would be interested in learning more about how you took real chocolate and made moldable chocolate. What was the term you used so I can look into it further? So, okay, very quickly, the reason why chocolate is difficult to work with as, I, as my time elapses, <laughs> um, the reason why uh, chocolate is difficult to work with is because the resources out there 
aren't as accessible to be quite honest. Not that many people teach chocolate, not many uh, resource, there aren't that many like, you, you know, uh, sugar artists always working with chocolate. And don't get me wrong, there are people out there who do, like Vanessa Greeley, myself, uh, and so on and so forth. But uh, when it comes to that question of molded chocolate, modeling chocolate versus real chocolate, essentially what I'm doing is... Where is the chocolate? No, I muffed it. Um, okay, okay, okay. Here it is. Chocolate is real chocolate filling. And what I'm doing with this is I'm putting it in a blend, a wrap blender, I'm sorry, a food processor, a food processor or a food chopper blending it up and then that friction will create it into a modeling paste that is different than modeling chocolate. Uh, modeling chocolate is this plus uh, like corn syrup and that is essentially real chocolate. Any last questions with a minute left? Yeah. All right, so again, thank you so much uh, to the ICES board for having me uh, take part in the ICES demonstrations here. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sad that I won't be able to extend my demonstrator pin. I remember Diane uh, Grunberg, literally last time I saw her, she has a full uh, list, if you will, of these pins from every uh, place that she's demoed at or taught classes uh, for. But I look forward to next year's convention in Texas, uh, as long as it's still in Fort Worth. Um, but yeah, I hope everyone here has been able to learn something uh, new that perhaps you can uh, potentially learn and take home with you guys to uh, you know, inspire you guys to work with chocolate. So again, um, thank you so much for having me demo, and I hope you guys learned something. Yeah, thank you guys. Nice. Good night. Good night.